once again to the Great Scott Podcast. Today I am joined by writer, actor, and director, Mr. Ted Lange. How's it going, Ted? Fine, Mike. How you doing? I'll, I'll have to give you the applause by myself. Uh, i give you the round of applause. Uh, okay, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a little round of applause, <laughs> too. All right? All right, all right. Sounds good. Uh, how are things where you're at? Everything good? Yeah, I just moved from uh, Los Angeles uh, down to um, Oceanside, which is just outside of San Diego. Oh, yeah. And it's really beautiful down here. Yeah, it's really gorgeous. So uh, having a lot of fun. Things are a little little crazy in Los Angeles now, aren't they? Yeah, it's a lot crazy. Not a little crazy, a lot crazy. A lot you crazy. Know. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, everything that's going on, you know. Um, yeah. But, you know, you just kind of, as an artist, you roll with whatever's coming down the pike. Yeah, absolutely. That is your thing, you know. You have to roll with it. You can't, you know try to stop it or push back on it as much as you have to be able to be malleable and deal with whatever the situation is and roll with it. Right, right. So uh, whenever things uh, calm down in Los Angeles, uh, any plans to go back there or are you there uh, permanently now? Oh, no, no. I still do stuff up in LA. As a matter of fact, uh, this coming weekend, I'm doing a reading of a play called Willie and Esther, and I'm doing that in L.A. Only It's a Black play, but we're changing the male character to Latino, and so we're going to do it and kind of uh, massage it a little bit and make it relevant to, uh, you know, the Hispanic community. And, uh, and I'm also, I've written a new play, and... That weekend, on Sunday, I'm going to do a reading, a private reading of my new play, kind of listen to it and see how much rewriting I have to do. You always have to rewrite. You always have to rewrite. And so what I always do is I get two actors whose talent I know. uh, I do a reading. And then we sit down, we sit around and we discuss it and we try to figure out what might, you know, jokes that need punching up or a situation that needs clarity. Now, before we, uh, speaking of your plays and uh, Broadway and all that, you were actually talking to me about another actor that you're going to be seeing on on Friday that we're all familiar with. Yeah, Garrett Morris and I started out together. We did a Broadway play called Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death. And uh, in that play, I understudied Garrett. And I went on, I I understudied six different actors, okay? And I went on for five actors, five of the six. The one guy I never went on for was Garrett Morris, because he (laughs) never missed, hold on, hold on. He never missed a... uh, there he is now, ladies and gentlemen. Let's hear it. <laughs> he, he never missed a performance. He was amazing. He's an amazing actor, and it was a great dramatic part. But he uh, he never missed a performance. He was really good. Are you guys talking about a uh, play? Uh, are you guys going to be working together at all? Uh... Uh, no, we're just kind of catching up on our careers. I haven't seen him in a while. You know, he did Two Broke Girls. I told him that was his pension money because he, he'd go in, he'd do a scene, you know, he'd have two or three jokes, made a ton of money, and uh, he, he, it was easy, you know? You go in on a sitcom like that, you don't have to get there till 10 o'clock so you can sleep late. Yeah. You, you only have one day you have to worry about, and that's the day that you take. So it's easy, money, particularly for a guy like Garrett, who's been around a long time. That's easy money, Yeah, you know? And so I said, I said, well, that's your pension money. You don't even have to draw on your pension. You just use that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Ted, um, well, first off, uh, please say hello to uh, Garrett for us uh, when you see him. 
Absolutely, I will, Mike. So, uh, Ted, we all know you best as uh, Isaac Washington, the affable, lovable bartender on, on, on the love boat. And um, so <laughs> there we go. That's the famous Isaac uh, uh, signature. So uh, speaking of the love boat, uh, we actually did have Gavin McLeod on right before he passed away about a, a year or so uh, before he passed. And um, Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. Gavin yeah. is the sweetest guy, the sweetest guy. And you actually knew Gavin way before the love boat ever happened. Yeah, he's a great guy. What? And, and I said that you had known Gavin before. Say that again? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I was saying that you, you actually knew Gavin before even the, the love boat even happened. No, no, I didn't. Oh, no? No. No, that's where I met him. I met him on love boat. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought you said. That's why I had to double check. Yeah. No, I, I met him on the show. As a matter of fact, when my agent called me, he said the guy that was going to be the captain was Darren McGavin. Do you know who Darren McGavin is? Uh, I know he's another actor. Yeah, he was in Christmas Story. Oh, yeah. He was the dad in Christmas Story. Yeah. So I had this picture of Darren McGavin, and I walk <laughs> on the set, and it's Gavin McCloud. And I go, these guys, come on, you know, <laughs> they get, they got they got to get the name straight. Right. But yeah, no, that's where I met Gavin, and he and Bernie, they were like the veterans, and they and Fred and I, we were like the the young kids, you know. And so the veterans have had to impart their knowledge on the young kids because we were kind of full of ourselves piss and vinegar you know what i mean yeah right we were we were hot shit we thought we were hot shit <laughs> and then gavin and bernie kind of like cooled us out and said hey 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 that's not how it works you know <laughs> right and so and we've been the whole cast has been friends to this very day we're still partners and buddies. As a matter of fact, Fred and I started a um, production company and we've been doing plays and I'm gonna direct Fred in um, uh, Give Him Hell Harry, which is a one man show. And we're gonna do that in, in uh, Indiana at a theater in Indiana. Uh, so yeah, we, we, you know, we, all of us, Bernie, Tweez, Jill, we, we're still good friends. You all live kind of close to each other as well, even though uh, you're down in Oceanside right now? No, no, we don't, no. Uh, Bernie's still in LA, Tweezes is in Seattle, Washington. Uh, Fred is in North Charlotte, North Carolina. And Jill is up in LA. Yeah, oh, so we're spread out. Yeah, we're, we're all spread, spread out. out. But we still, you know, we stay in close communication with each other and we always know what each other, let each other know what we're doing. And uh, I, I do want to go back to uh, Gavin McLeod for just, just a moment. Uh, and I just have to say what a man he was. What a great guy that he was. Um, very authoritative in his uh, speech and um, just a very strong guy up until the day he, he passed away. Yeah, Gavin was, he was the father figure and he was the boss. Yeah. And uh, he was a gentle soul. And he, uh, he made sure that uh, he, everything flows from the head down. And he was definitely the head. Yeah. And he made it, he, he taught Fred and I how to be gracious to guest stars and how to welcome them and make them feel a part of a, a wonderful experience, which we did. We, we learned that from Gavin and Bernie. And uh, so that if you came on the love boat, I guarantee you, you had more fun than even if you did your own shows. And we had a couple of times where, where we had people who had problems on their own shows wanted to come and switch over to our show because we were having so much fun, you know? So, so yeah, we, uh, we, we made your time. Hopefully you had a good time when you came to do the love boat. 
Now what? Comedy and romance. You comedy know, and comedy. comedy and romance. Now, yeah. did you guys ever have any trouble with any of the guest star, the guest stars that came on? No, no uh, egos or anything like that, or was everybody pretty much happy to to be there? Well, uh, no, there was always depending on the uh, the star, you know, and uh, sometimes the some of the stars were full of themselves. Yeah. Uh, we had one time we had. Uh, a guy come on that was a uh, action person, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so they were kind of gruff, and we said, "Hey, hey, hey, <laughs> this is comedy, you know? Just relax, you know?" Because he was like, I need, "I need this, I need this." Hey, hey, you'll get whatever you need, but just relax. And uh, we had one woman that came on from a tough political situation she was on dynasty i'm not going to tell you who it was but she was ready. her dukes were up man she was ready because she was fighting on dynasty yeah and she came in and and by the end of the second day she told us she couldn't believe what a happy set we were you know because she was fighting for every ounce of what she got but most of the time you know, people that came because you're now a guest in someone else's house. You know, most people were on their best behavior. Yeah. And uh, once in a while, you know, we, you got someone like Milton Burrow, who kind of knows comedy backwards and forwards, and he insisted on things going a certain way. <laughs> but even he had to cool out a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so. Our, our show was one of the happier shows in town that you knew if you did an episode of our show, you were going to have some fun. And that's, if you ever talk to any actor, one of the main reasons they get in the show business is they want to have fun. And you see them on a talk show, you say, well, how was, that? how was the movie? Well, we had a lot of fun. That's the only reason you get in the show, not the only reason, but that's one of the main reasons you get in the show business is you want to uh, have a career where you enjoy going to the job and you have fun and you make money. And that's what our show was. Our show was you come on, you're going to make some money, you're going to have some fun, you're going to meet some interesting people, and you're going to get a chance to be funny. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, speaking of the love boat, uh, they're actually uh, doing a, 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 a another love boat. Uh, have you heard that? Uh, I'm a sure. reboot. Yeah, the reboot, yeah. A reality show reboot. And Jill is going to be on it. And I'm going to be on it. Yes. I already, I already filmed my section in, uh, in uh, Barcelona, Spain, and in uh, Gibraltar. So I did a couple of uh, episodes that I will be on, and then Jill will also be on. Uh, on that new series. And what it is, it's a dating show. It's a whole thing about finding love. So they need some advice from the bartender, the world's <laughs> most famous bartender on how to find love. And uh, so that's part of what I'm doing on there. Anyway, uh, it was fun. We, I met the contestants and um, we shot for a couple of days in uh, Spain, yeah. It's as my friend says, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Love boat. <laughs> this is 40 years later, Mike, and I'm still turning up on the show. I know, I know. It's amazing. How is that even possible? You know? <laughs> I know. Do you still get uh, yeah. um, uh, royalties at all every time the love boat airs uh, at all? I call it gas money, I don't call it royalties. I don't call it residuals. I call it gas money. <laughs> and now the way things are going is half a tank getting filled <laughs> up, not a whole tank, <laughs> you know? Uh, but yeah, I still get residuals. Uh, yeah, certainly. And because and now, because the whole thing is opened up, it's not just, um, you know, network reruns or whatever, or, or, or syndicated reruns. It's also streaming. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's all over the place. You know, there's a lot of different avenues now to make money off of the show. So yes, I still, I still get uh, 
some money from the show. Now, one one question that my uh, my parents were wondering about uh, that they wanted me to ask you was, um, did you know how to how to mix the, the the drinks beforehand when you got the the role of Isaac? Yeah. What what about when I got the role of Isaac? Uh, did you know how? Did you have to learn? What's the question? To, yeah, yeah. So, did you have to learn how, how to mix drinks at all, or or did you already know how how to mix drinks? Oh no no no! I was never a bartender in my salad days as an actor. So uh, if you watch the first year of Love Boat, you'll always see me putting an umbrella or fresh fruit into a drink. You never see me mix a drink. And then at the end of the first year, I went to bartending school. And then you see me doing all of this other tricky stuff, you know, uh, peeling a lemon and cutting up limes and pineapple and doing all of this other stuff and free pouring the drinks and all of that. But I had to learn that because I didn't know that uh, prior to my doing the show because I was never a bartender. Yeah. And one of the things, I had just come off a series called um, That's My Mama. And uh, I had a mustache and I had a mustache that came down like that. And when we shot the pilot, the, um, the bartender said, you can't, you can't have hair on your face and be in food services. And I explained it. I said, if I shave off my mustache, I look like I shouldn't even be in a bar. I look like I'm 17 because I just played 17 on another series. So I said, I'm not shaving off my mustache. I'm keeping the mustache. Anyway, the show hits. It's a big deal. It's in the top five, most of the time, number one. And we went back a year later to shoot another special. And all the bartenders had mustaches that came down and down. And I said, hey, you can't have a mustache in food <laughs> services. They said, no, but we want the tips, you know? And so they were getting tips because all the passengers would call them Isaac and then they would do the thing, you know, or a point or something and then they would get a tip. So that just goes to show you that sometimes fantasy can affect reality. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yes. So now there's also a, uh, a uh, drink named, named, named Isaac. Right. Yeah. That was Fred Grandy's idea. We were sitting around with some... Um, Princess Cruz's uh, big wigs. And we were sitting around and we're talking and kibitzing back and forth. And Fred Grandy said to uh, this big wig, you know, you guys are missing a huge opportunity with Ted. And they go, well, what do you mean? I said, well, Fred goes, he's the number one bartender that has anything to do with cruise ships and you don't have a drink with his name on it. And the guy goes, that's a good idea. He said, Ted, what drink, what, what alcohol should we use? I said, well, uh, for me, rum, because Isaac is, you know, he'd be like an island guy, you know, Isaac, rum would be the drink, it should be the base of the drink. And so that's what they did. They came up with a rum drink called the Isaac, and they sell it on the uh, on the ship. So whenever you take a cruise, you can sit in any of the bars on Princess Cruises, and you can order an Isaac. And if you want to do it and you're not on the ship, you can go on YouTube, type in my name, then type in Isaac on YouTube, and you'll see how to make the drink. I, I, I will definitely do that. I will definitely do that. Yeah. Now, Ted, uh, one other thing. Um, I, I know I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, but um, you're you're kind of the uh, second generation person in your family to be on TV because your your mom had a show uh, on on TV as well. Up in San Fran. Yeah, my mom in San Francisco. She had a television show, but also my father was an actor in Los Angeles in the 1950s. So I got it from both ends. I got it from my mom who had a TV show and then I got it from my dad who was an actor. 
uh, in a theater called the Ebony Showcase in the 1950s in Los Angeles. And my brother and I used to go and see him in uh, plays. Uh, and I think that's probably where the idea was born. And then when my, when my mother went into television, it kind of like solidified the idea of maybe following a career in show business. Yeah, absolutely. My mom was a talker. If you ever met my mom, my mom was a talker. So she was perfect for uh, interview shows because she would get into whatever was going on, you know? And back then it was the Vietnam War and uh, free speech and things like that. So my mom would have guests come on that she could uh, talk to or have them, you know, they would get back and forth into great dialogue. So yeah, uh, she was a talker. So I've, uh, so I've heard of some uh, people kind of discouraging their kids from going into show business because they know the uh, troubles with it, but uh, were your parents for you going into uh, show business? Absolutely, because uh, that was the one place you could see black achievement was in show business, you know, whether you were a musician like Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, any music was one aspect. And then you had Sidney Poitier, Bill Cosby, Greg Morris in uh, television. And then you had like James Earl Jones in theater. So yeah, no, uh, and this was what the statement my mother used to say all the time was, uh, I would say, do you think um, uh, I can make it in show business? And she would say, Teddy, there's room at the top. It's the bottom that's crowded. <laughs> yep. So that was something I always kept in the back of my mind. And then plus I had my high school drama teacher who, uh, in a sense, prepared me for show business because he opened the doors to uh, me having a variety of experiences like opera, ballet, classical music, Shakespeare. Uh, he opened those doors. And so it was a, it was a combined effort, you know, uh, to push me towards uh, show business. Yeah, I was going to say, you studied. That's why I do so many things now. I mean, I, 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 huh? Oh, no. I, so I was just going to say, I mean, uh, yeah, I was going to say, so you started out being a Shakespearean actor. Yeah, exactly. And uh, my first play out of high school was uh, Romeo and Juliet. That was my very first play. I had done the Scottish play in high school. I had done the Scottish play in junior high school. So, uh, you know, I was familiar with Shakespeare so that when I graduated, I went into Romeo and Juliet. Um, that was kind of uh, solidifying what I knew about classical theater. But, you know, because of that, because I was exposed to so many different areas, you know, I, I became a director, I became a playwright, I became a producer, because I wanted to be in show business and I wanted to maintain some kind of level of excellence in the business. And so I read up on a lot of people, you know, that were involved in the show business. And so I, I would go back and forth between television and theater. And uh, I was very lucky that I loved doing both. I loved being in show business and theater, and I loved being in show business and television and film. I went to the American Film Institute to study uh, film directing. So that helped me when I got on Love Boat and I wanted to uh, direct television because I had studied it in film school. Did you do a lot of plays while doing Love Boat as well? Yes, absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, I miss the first Love Boat Christmas party because I was doing a tech rehearsal for a production of Hamlet. Oh, yeah. And uh, 
a spelling secretary called me up and said, hey, Ted, you missed the Christmas party. And I go, yeah, I was, uh, had a tech rehearsal for Hamlet. They said, well, Mr. Spelling would appreciate it if you would come to the Christmas parties. I said, yeah, but I was directing Hamlet, Hamlet. And they go, Mr. Spelling would appreciate it <laughs> if you would come to the Christmas party. So I made sure that I wasn't directing any plays during the Christmas season. But uh, yeah, man, uh, we had a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. I did that with Glenn Turman and it was, it was a spectacular production. Turned out really well. Now you said that you're working on a couple of plays right now, or uh, you had just, <clears throat> or, or that you had just written one, and uh, you're looking for a couple actors uh, to uh, get the parts down. Yeah. So what I do is, whenever I write a play, I do a reading, a private reading, and I try to uh, serve. I feed the actors. I serve them spaghetti and red wine. And the most important ingredient in that menu is red wine. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because when you finish a play and you read it and all the actors are there and you read it and everything, and you say, well, what do you think? And they say, great play, Ted. The best play you've ever written. Loved it. Am I going to do this part? Go, yeah, you've been to that part. They go, wow, well, this is perfect. Play is perfect. Then they drink a little red wine. He said, but I got a question, Ted. Uh, over here, I say this, and then I, what is, but what happens over, and so what happens is you go from the best play you've ever written to what the real problems in the play are because the red wine has loosened their tongue. So that's, what, that's what's going to happen this weekend. I'm going to have a reading of the play. I'm gonna serve them dinner and red wine and we'll see how they feel, how they really feel about the play. And then I do a rewrite. You all, you know, some people think once they write it, it's done, it's locked, it's over and out. No, no, you have to do rewrites. You do rewrites up until opening night, I've done rewrites, you know, because you gotta get it right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, you have to, when you have a preview audience, you see, what stuff works and you see what stuff doesn't work on the stage. So, uh, yeah, I, I try to, uh, you know, do a lot of uh, massaging of the play to make it work. And then, so, and, and if any of your listeners are interested, my plays are all on Amazon. I got about a dozen plays on Amazon. I got one that's called the Footnote Historians Trilogy. Footnote Historians Trilogy. And it's three history plays about American history. One is about George Washington and the American Revolution. Now, the reason I call myself a footnote historian is because I always write from the perspective of the African-American in the story. And the only way you're gonna get information is to read a lot of biographies on George Washington, and then you check the footnotes and you'll find the information you want about the person you're writing about. So Washington had a slave named William Lee. And uh, so I was writing a play about their relationship, Washington and William Lee. Uh, it's called George Washington's Boy. Then I have another play about John Brown and five black guys were with John Brown at Harper's Ferry. And most history books don't talk about the five black guys. They talk about John Brown and his son. So again, you have to follow a lot of footnotes to get the five black guys that were with John Brown. And I write it from the perspective of one of the black guys. And then the third one is a civil war. So I got uh, American Revolution, pre-Civil War, Civil War. And the Civil War play is called Lady Patriot, and it's about three ladies that were patriots during the Civil War. One was for the Confederacy, one was for the Union, and one was for 
uh, a black girl named Mary Bowser who was for the new world that was coming, which would be having African Americans freed as slaves and becoming a part of this country. And uh, so that's that's on Amazon. That's called the Footnote Historians Trilogy. And then I got another three plays that are Shakespearean in nature. And two of those plays are written in iambic pentameter. And they're called The Cause My Soul, which is a prequel to Othello. Oh, yeah. Okay. The Cause My Soul, prequel to Othello. And then the other one is called The Tears of Shylock. Now, both of those are written in iambic pentameter. The Tears of Shylock is about the character Shylock from Merchant of Venice. And in my play, it run, it coincides with Merchant of Venice. So Merchant of Venice is going along. And then when Shylock is on stage in Merchant of Venice, you know what's going on. But then when he leaves stage, he leaves to my play, Tears of Shylock. And there's a story going on a separate story going on with Shylock off stage from Merchant. And uh, that second story that goes on has to do with being an immigrant in um, a country that you don't belong to, really. And, and that's what a lot of Jewish people were. They were immigrants in Venice in the 1500s. Yeah. And one of Shylock's best friends in my play is Othello, who was also an immigrant. So you're getting the view of two immigrants in a country that is not their country. And uh, so, and then the third play is called Shakespeare Over My Shoulder, because there is a theory that Shakespeare didn't write the plays. The person of William Shakespeare, some people call him the man from Stratford, uh, that he didn't write the plays. The plays were written either by Will, uh, uh, Edward de Vere, Francis Bacon, Christopher Marlowe. And so I have those three characters plus the character of William Shakespeare. And it takes place during a pandemic, during the Black Plague. So I do a lot of, and I wrote it during the uh, COVID pandemic. So I got a lot of COVID jokes in there, masquerading as plague jokes. Yeah. So Ted, I have one, one final question for you, sir. Um, what advice do you give to someone who wants to get into to show business themselves? Um, never give up. Never give up. Do your homework, study, you know, whether it's acting, writing, directing, you gotta, you gotta study and study the best. Like uh, I was telling a friend of mine, uh, I said, I absolutely love the movies. And I went and saw uh, Top Gun. Do you, have you seen Top Gun, Mike? I have, yes, sir. Okay, that's a really strong Tom Cruise movie because Tom Cruise knows how to make a movie for an audience. He just does. And uh, I mean, he has the Tom Cruise run in it. He has a romantic interest in it. And then he has action. And then the action, um, just when you think it's over, it escalates. That's good uh, movie script writing. Just when you think it's all over, it escalates. That's what Steven Spielberg did in uh, uh, Jurassic Park. Just when you think it's over, it escalates. So if a guy drives a Jeep off into a tree, well, you say, okay, it's in a tree. They're going to climb down the tree and get away. No, the, the Jeep is going to follow you as you're climbing down. I mean, it escalates. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's, that's good uh, uh, writing. That's good movie writing. So study well, whoever you love, whether it's set design, costume design, lighting, whatever it is, study the best uh, and don't give up. And if you can, try to 
meet someone that's in the business and see if you can follow them around and see what they do or you know what I mean or get recommendations from them on what books to read or where did they go to school you know it's it's hard but when you're chasing your dream it's more fun than just having a job to make money right absolutely you know right it's absolutely. more fun well ted thank you so much for your time sir i'm glad that we finally connected that we got to do this and uh, good good luck with the plays Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you for your time. God bless you, sir. You too, my friend. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.